Welcome everyone who's joining us for this artist webinar uh, hosted by Better Days 2020. We're excited to have join us today Kelsey Harrison and Jason Manley, who are the artists in charge of the wonderful memorial that has recently been installed on the grounds of the Utah State Capitol. Kelsey Harrison was born in California and is a Memphis, Tennessee based sculptor. Her work has been shown in institutions across the nation, including the Jewish Museum, the Knockdown Center in New York, and the Soma Arts in San Francisco. She received her BFA in sculpture from Purchase College in New York and her MFA in sculpture at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. She's currently an assistant professor in sculpture at the University of Memphis in Tennessee. Jason Manley creates drawings, sculptures, and public artworks that integrate writing with the built environment. He repurposes industrial materials and functional forms to explore the effects of language on the physical design of things and places. He is an MFA graduate of the University of Arizona and his artwork has been displayed across the United States and internationally. He's an associate professor of art and the head of sculpture area at Weber State University in Ogden, Utah. Welcome Kelsey and Jason. We're so glad to have you with us today. Thank you. Uh, we have some exciting things to share with you today. Kelsey and Jason are going to share the process of creating the wonderful memorial that uh, is on the grounds of the Utah State Capitol. It's called A Path Forward, and it commemorates the expansion of voting rights here in Utah and as well as nationally. Um, they're going to share with us about the artistic process kind of walk us through the whole thing, share pictures and a little bit of video about uh, how they went about creating this awesome work of art. We do have some questions from Utah students that we will ask along the way. And if you are joining us and have questions, please just put the questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Tiffany. It's, it's great to be here today. Hello, everybody out there on the radio waves, um, internet, you may know it as that. Um, and, um, so Kelsey, do you, should we, do you have any way you want to start or should we just, should I pull up the presentation? Yeah, just, I think you should just share your screen. Okay, here we go. So, um, we wanted to share the whole process. There's a lot there and I, um, with the making of a path forward, um, a, um, sculptural monument just to, um, um, suffragists at the um, which was created on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and to approach our sculpture we um, essentially had four main elements of sculpture forms for fabrication or for creating the sculpture and um, with and these are this is you know design and sculpture coming together in 3D typography, furniture, architectural forms, and a path walkway. It's kind of the three main uh, ways of uh, making that we took on as a, an approach. Um, <clears throat> so the first one is uh, 3D wax printing. And, um, and so this is, we use a lot of new technology. Um, this is, this 3D wax printing was created at, at a company called Form in Portland, Oregon. And um, it is a innovative process where they are, well, this is the, this is a quote by uh, Lucretia Mott, uh, Lucretia Mott um, because it shakes a bit the very foundation of privilege, which is a part of our, um, the, our quotation wall. But uh, the process here is a, uh, a new uh, way of, uh, well, it's wax printing, but it's also another kind of material, which they wouldn't tell me what it is. I guess it's a secret. And then they coat it with wax. I believe that's how it was made. And it kind of disintegrates out in the um, foundry. Um, this is when it becomes bronze. And so it, it's, so it's, so we start, I started, or we started with the computer, designed it, and then worked with this company to have the wax made, and then worked with another company to have the bronze made, which well, we have more photos of that. 
But that leads us to our next thing, which is woodworking. I'll let Kelsey describe this part. Yeah, just for the for educational purposes, some like vocab around um, what we did in the last slides. Um, we use SketchUp to design 3D models for uh, to have a file to send to these fabricators. Um, so Jason and I modeled them in SketchUp, which is a free program. Um, there's also a paid version of the program, but there is a free version of the program online if, if students are interested in playing with that. Um, some schools also have subscriptions to it. Um, and the process by which we, the wax became bronze is not, you know, it wasn't a witchcraft process where we turned wax into bronze, but rather a process called lost wax casting. So again, might be something that your teachers are already talking about, but if you're interested in how that process from translation, translating um, wax to bronze works, the key terms are lost wax casting. It's a very ancient process, so it makes us, um, we use very new technology to use very old technology. Like we're talking bronze age, we're talking 3000 BC, we're talking like, you know, my history is not great, probably earlier than that. Um, and now here we are in woodworking land. Again, very ancient. Some of these techniques are very ancient. Um, woodworking largely hasn't changed very much since the Egyptians. The same types of joints that Egyptians used, we use. However, this is a really weird way of making a chair because it has to come apart in order to go to the foundry. So I had to make this chair, not like I would make a normal chair, but actually in segments that I'm, the reason I'm clamping them all together in this image, and the reason there's no left side of the chair is that when it goes to the foundry, they're gonna take molds off of each separate object and then cast them into wax. So there's a lot of translation in this whole process from one material to another. But the way we were able to get that nice wood grain and um, fabric texture on the bronze was that we took a mold off of real wood and real fabric. Um, the, the, foundry, the foundry, which is the, the, the place that, that actually does the metal work, a uh, place that, that can, has, the, has the power to melt metal and pour metal, um, they did an incredible job with sort of keeping the fidelity or, or faithfulness to our materials. Um, so here I just use normal, regular, uh, I guess I'll call them like Egyptian or English woodworking techniques, um, working in oak. I was copying a chair that exists in the um, city and county building. So a lot of the reasons that we use these furniture pieces that we made was they, they all had historical significance. They all had relevance to the um, legislation or the laws that um, gave women the right to vote. And in this case, um, this chair came from the building and the site on which the Utah constitution was signed that allowed women the right to vote in the state of Utah. On the left, we have a CNC or a computer numerical cutting milling. Um, basically what that is, is a spinning cutting bit on a computer navigated arm. So I gave it this scan of um, that, that phrase in the Utah constitution. So what you'll see engraved on the table is a very faithful rendering of how it was physically written, how that document was physically written out, um, how the article which Grant granted women the right to vote in Utah was physically written out on the, on the original document. So that is carved into the table surface and it's on this tabletop that's made out of mahogany. And mahogany is a very exotic African wood. This is African mahogany. And this table was built to look like a, a very specific, also historical reference. Um, the document, what is it called? The Declaration of Sentiments was this very important document in the, in the history of suffrage. Um, 1848, a bunch of radical ladies in upstate New York, in Seneca Falls, New York, got together and they wrote this document that was based on, it's kind of a riff on the Declaration of Independence, but, but subbing all men for all women or all people, right? So it was this, this use of this document um, to make a point that under the terms of the original document, women aren't granted the same right as, rights as men. And so they write this document called the Declaration of Sentiments, which among other things, places suffrage on the list of demands for women's, women's equality. So 
Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was there. I think Lucretia Mott was also there. Susan B. Anthony was not there, but later became very involved with these same people. Um, so 1848, a little bit earlier than Utah's constitution, which was what, 1896, I believe. Um, but again, just a really important historical reference for the movement in general. So the piece deals with like Utah's role in women's suffrage movement, but it also looks at the national movement for suffrage in the entire United States. So after this tabletop gets cut out, I turned on the lathe, which maybe people are doing in their woodshop classes, the base, oh, thank you, um, the base of the table to look like this one. And I worked off of this image, so it's kind of hard to get measurements off of an image, but I sort of just like took um, reference points. I knew that the table was a certain height, so then I knew that that height had to correlate to certain distance in the image. Um, I don't know how into the weeds you want me to get, but the table is very short in real life. So I needed to actually change the angle of the legs to be slightly historically inaccurate in order to fit with the chairs. Um, so you'll see that in the final version. If you check out the legs on this table, they're very flat as they reach the ground. Ours are much more vertical in their angles when they, when they hit the ground. Um, this is the process of when they've welded all of the bronze cast pieces together. So you see these, these discolorations through the piece, and that's the moment that you see that they're connecting pieces that they cast separately into bronze. And this is actually the first moment we got to see the chair all together, because as you saw in that first image, I gave them a chair with only a right leg, right? And a right arm rest. So this is actually the first time we see the whole chair together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kelsey, we had some students talking just as you're talking about your historical accuracy and things like that. How long did it take you to research those types of things? And is that pretty normal in creating sculpture to have or sculpture to have that kind of historical component to it? Yeah, Jason and I had to do a lot of research to to make this piece make sense. You know, um, I don't think either Jason or I had like a very strong historical knowledge of the movement, besides the, the general things that you get in elementary school and middle school growing up. I mean, clearly they're getting a better version of that now, but um, so there was a lot of research we had to do um, thinking about like, well, what symbols or what forms are gonna represent this historical event? Well, like, well, first we have to know what happened and then we have to know what forms are relevant to signifying the, the movement. So there's a definitely like probably like months, I would say, of going back and forth with doing research and and um, kind of tweaking our vision. I think we started by talking about the yellow sash that suffragists wore as a form. There was a kind of pin um, that suffragists wore that we were talking about early on. Um, and then this table started showing up. For some reason, that that table stands for that event. It's it's just circulated quite widely, that image of that table. And we wanted from the beginning to make a monument that you could like live inside of, be inside of, sit down in, interact with, spend time with, and spend time in. And so this furniture started to make a lot of sense for that reason. Like it could be a place to hang out in addition to being a place to think about the progress that, that this um, movement has brought us. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. We did have some other questions too, because they said, why did you decide on the table and chairs? And you just perfectly answered it. So awesome. And I just wanted to say this image is what uh, Kelsey was describing as the lost wax casting process. This is kind of the exciting part where the bronze is melted um, at about three or 2000 degrees or 3000 degrees when it's poured. Um, and um, it's just kind of the exciting, pro you know, the process of metal casting um, is like, you know, melting metal down. Bronze is an alloy of copper and um, mainly copper. And then another, other alloys like uh, tin historically was used by, you know, like, like Kelsey said, like by the Egyptians and uh, really early bronze casting, yeah, 3000 BC. It's an ancient process. And um, I mean, it's fun to, um, to work with, I mean, 
uh, for the reason that it is this ancient process, but also this new, there's new technology that like this 3D wax printing is really new, um, a way of working with it, with the, this kind of medium. And so, we're, I mean, we're essentially working from the computer to then to the, uh, this traditional metal casting process, which I think is fascinating. Here's, I have, a, I put a website link to Bear Bronze if you're, if you, if you all are interested in seeing more images of the process, but here's another one from their website of, um, you know, they get dressed up in this, like this, uh, space gear to protect from the heat and the, uh, you sometimes UV light from the, um, furnace. Um, and I mean, we cast like this at Weber state university. I mean, we have a metal, we have a founder. I think Kelsey, you have a foundry too at your university or yeah um we don't do this investment shell we do standard investment which is really crazy um do you guys do investment shell at weber we do that's what we primarily do is investment shells it's just like this so if if, if you all out there want to weber state is in ogden you can start to put that on your calendar to apply uh whatever year that may be but we uh we do this process we don't dress in these space shoots though as much but i think this is really for them to protect i mean we have l limited space gear mostly like hard hats and shields um yeah any other questions on the foundry process before we move on this is i think this is the last image of that metal casting process or no i think you answered them there was just one that wanted to know what metals you used and i think you you answered that so Okay, the next section is on uh, digital design um, and planning. This is SketchUp, uh, the, the main, um, like Kelsey mentioned, this is the main um, um, digital program we used, computer software. Um, I use some other ones as well, but this is the kind of, we both use this for planning different things out. There's a ton of planning uh, and essentially us two artists playing architects, um, pseudo architects, you could say, <laughs> and designing and really, you know, this, this plan we're looking at here wasn't the actual final plan it changed. And that's kind of what happens. You have a, you have a plan and then things change. And we work with a lot of different people in including, um, the Capitol grounds and, and better days foundation. There's a lot of people weighing in at different times and, you know, we also work with uh, extensively with Catherine Kitterman at Better Days Foundation, and um, she was really helping to inform on the uh, historical content, like these, this specific language, and this uh, laser cutting at Wasatch Laser was another uh, process we used, just another digital process from computer to a fabricator that uses a laser cutter to cut into the stainless steel and cut out the text. Um, this shows you the different, um, the main um, voting rights achievements uh, legislation that we were um, get paying homage to. And, you know, looking at how uh, different, um, legislation that was passed to help um, give voting rights to women, but also to um, people of color and, you know, celebrating that progress that has been made, but also signifying that there's more progress to be made. It's a democracy is a work in progress. This is uh, the sculpture, the structure and path is another thing we had to really um, spend a lot of time on. Um, Kelsey, do you have anything to add about this part? Or? Yeah, I do. Just because I found this whole process to be really interesting. Um, this is the, someone asked on, on one of the questions, like, what's the largest sculpture you've ever made? And for, I think, both of us, this. Um, and so there was considerations that, that I, didn't, I didn't know we would have to take. We had to work with an engineer which was very smart, right? Um, we got an engineer to look at our plans and tell us what, what structures we needed to support the whole design. 
and you'll see like the big slab in this drawing represents actually 30 inches underground a big slab of concrete with pillars of concrete coming up so that these doorways could stand on those pillars um, and then we backfilled around it there'll be pictures of this in the in the slides going forward backfilled around it with um, road base which, which is what that's called and um, this is a backhoe up at the, this, I took this picture of this hole because it just made me so happy to finally break ground on this piece. Um, it's not a pretty hole or anything, but it's like, you know, now we really got to do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, those pillars and that slab, the, the idea behind that is that the ground freezes in Utah. And when the ground freezes, you know, you've seen a water bottle expand when ice, when water turns to ice, um, the ground would heave if it was freezing underneath those door frames and ultimately that heaving and thawing and heaving and thawing would throw them out of whack. And it's really important that they be in alignment because otherwise you'd really be able to tell your eye can just, is unforgiving of, of things being not parallel. And so that slab underneath the ground and those pillars coming up was like an anchor underneath the frost layer. Um, this may be getting a little into the weeds and a little nerdy, but like I found this stuff to be totally interesting. Um, the furniture, we didn't have to put as far down because it didn't need to be as parallel. That wasn't really as much of a concern, but this wall certainly did, right? So this wall has a very, very deep base um, that goes underground. So as you're standing at the monument, you can imagine all the infrastructure that's underground. Of course, that's true of all buildings, but even something of this scale has a lot to consider in terms of foundation. That's fascinating, right? And I feel like there's a there's a metaphor there for for lots of things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this is the this is the wall they mocked up at the foundry to to weld the bronze um, to the stainless door frame. It needed to sit just right. They needed to have a, a mock up of the wall we had poured on site. Um, there was a lot of yeah, like nerve wracking moments of like, will this fit? Because it was made elsewhere and it needs to fit. You know this is down in Springville, so it needs to fit like an hour away, you know? So um, Jason, do you want to talk about this one? Uh, yeah, this is where uh, the part where it's bringing it all together. Um, the next image is kind of how all these different elements start to fit together. Um, and, you know, my advice to young artists out there is to, what I always tell um, my students is to work in broad strokes, you know? Try to try to think about the whole, and then work your way towards details in the art making process. So, um, you know that was um, something we were balancing at all times, and um, yeah. So, not to get too bogged down by little tiny details, um, and then, you know, with this wall, with the wall piece, there's a, a I think seven quotations. If you remember, you think I would know that. For a fact, <laughs> I think it's, I don't remember numbers very well. I, I remember, uh, you know, all the quotes. Um, there's some that I, I think really stand out to me more than others. My favorite is the one on top that is, truth is powerful and it prevails by Sojourner, Sojourner Truth. Um, and uh, and m many other like inspirational quotes um, about describing um, these these famous activists, their, their, um, you know, their struggle and their fight and their, their ability to work together to, for change. And this is the piece coming into place. Kelsey, do you want to describe that moment? <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to talk about that. This was quite a day. Um, you just don't think about how much work everything is until you're a sculptor and you have to do it. Um, that is something I tell all my students, like you think it's gonna take one hour, multiply by five. Maybe if you're lucky, you can get to a point where you only have to multiply it by three. Um, but everything takes forever. Um, and everything is gratifying, but also difficult. So this process, they, you see the guys in the corner, um, those are wonderful fabricators from um, bare bronze who drove this piece up um, and we needed obviously it's like almost 2,000 pounds not obviously but it's like almost 2,000 pounds so we couldn't just lift it up and put it on the put it on the base 
it also needed to fit perfectly in this opening in the concrete. Um, and we didn't have any guarantee that it was a perfect fit yet. Um, so we had a contractor who helped us out through this whole process who had a, um, it wasn't even a forklift. It was some other strange, like misapplied tool um, to get it out of the truck bed without tilting like crazy. So we had a, it, it was just nuts. They, we had a guy kind of trying to counterweight it by standing on it as we took it out of the truck. Like OSHA was not there. You can edit that out. I don't know. Um, but it made it onto this base. Um, we had to ratchet the door frame tighter to get it into the fit the opening that was pre-existing because obviously there's no play in concrete. Um, and we had to make it fit over bolts that were already cast in concrete. So there's these four bolts at the base of the plate of the door. Um, so it was a real, like, this was a moment of real suspense and it worked out the first time, which is amazing because we only really only had one shot, but um, it was a huge group effort. You could see everybody there. We all got a sunburn. It was a whole event. Um, everyone was very jubilant after we got it on there. Yeah, I mean, I have to just say that this was the this was the part that I was most concerned about from the very beginning when we started to strategize how the installation was just, you know, talking to people at Bear Bronze and what they wanted to do. And um, I, I thought it would be welded on site, but it was moved as one piece. And um, I'm really glad it worked out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was curious about that. So that entire wall of quotes was one piece when it showed up on site that day. Mm -hmm. That's impressive. Yeah, and the furniture also um, showed up, I think that day or the day before. Um, and we actually had to store it in this building, in the council hall building. And apparently they actually have one of the chairs from council hall, from, sorry, from the city and county building. So people were like doing these double takes of like, I know that chair, you know, like that's in my office or, so that was cool. Um, but these chairs had really long um, threaded bolts coming out of the bottom in order to like anchor them down into those concrete discs you saw in the rendering and in the last image. Um, so everything has these like roots that go down into these holes in the pavers. And again, everything's difficult. So like getting those pavers to have holes that align with the concrete that's below them. Once you've hidden the concrete, you know, it's just all sorts of little logistical problems, but we got it all together. These are anchored with a type of um, really hardcore uh, construction adhesive epoxy. And um, I think that's all I'll say about that, yeah. The last images are like the unveiling and the finished work. Um, Got to give it to you guys renting a, a curtain from the opera. Is that right? Yeah, it was from Utah Opera. It was it was a, one of their backdrops. We had to be very careful with it because I think it it went back to the Utah Opera to, for future use. So we had to be very careful with how we handled it. I mean, just again, so talking about how like logistical problems are everywhere, and you just don't think about them. Finding a piece of fabric that large was that pretty difficult. Uh, I wasn't personally involved in that, but I think that we had a personal connection with the Utah Opera. Nyland McBain had a, a personal connection there. And so um, I think that it worked out in our favor. But yes, this is a very large sculpture, sculpture to cover, right? Let us not waste our talents in the cauldron of modern nothingness. Let's this is a little video I shot. And to, to endeavor um, to do something little why we live in this protracted bleak. Unveiling. Life. Martha's admonition, her call to action. So that was pretty exciting, the, the full suspense of having it covered and, and then the big reveal for the public and also the whole event. Oh, these are a little, that one got out of, out of, out of place there. It's a more construction shot of the path. Did you have, have anything to say about the path, Kelsey? Path design? Well, there was a lot of questions on that sheet that asked why the sheet of questions collected from students. Why do the door frames get wider? What does that mean? Um, and Jason touched on it a little bit when he was showing the um, 
the, the door frames in progress, but basically the way we thought about it was that the 19th Amendment was a landmark for, for voting rights, equity, and equality, but it did not include everybody. It generally applied to white women, um, didn't include native women, didn't include um, Chinese immigrants, didn't include native people at all. Native people weren't considered citizens at the time. Um, and people of color, while they had the right to vote, um, that, but that right wasn't protected and it was very often compromised and very often um, people of color were prevented from voting through um, various legal subterfuges um, that made it difficult to vote, voter suppression, which is a word you might be hearing right now. Um, so basically the way we thought of it is that each door frame gets wider with each passage of legislation that includes native people, that includes the children of Chinese immigrants, that includes that protects the right to vote of people of color. And so as each door frame gets wider, it represents a legislation or a piece of legislation that expands access to the right to vote. And as you walk towards the Capitol, we sort of thought of it as a timeline that goes from Seraph Young to the present. Um, and that Capitol is the place where the, the laws are currently being made. So our hope is that that door frame just gets wider and wider and wider through their actions. Great. Okay. Well, I mean, that's pretty much the it. it. There, there's just more images of the piece finished here. I don't know if we want to switch more to questions or. Yeah, I think there's a couple of questions that that maybe have been hinted at, but but maybe we'll just get a more direct answer. Um, there's a student who wants to know what your favorite part of the memorial was, and that can be either to create or now that it's finished or both. For each of you, what would be if you if you had to choose? Not that you know, it's like a parent. You don't have a favorite child, but if you had to choose, what do you what do you like the best about about this? Jason, you want to go first? Okay, I'll go first. Um, for me, that's an easy answer. It's uh, really the honor of being able to have participated in this. Um, I think. You know, the ability to connect with, with people in the community, better days, a lot of the people that were involved, uh, working with Kelsey and being involved in this project that was like much larger than myself for this really, I think really important uh, issue with, with our democracy, which is to really place focus on voting rights um, looking at the learning about the history was it was incredibly valuable for me learning you know that was it was something that again as an adult like kind of forget about things that some of the history I learned when I was younger um, but relearning it was very valuable to me um, yeah I think I'll turn it over to Kelsey now I could go on but um, that's a great answer um, much more expansive than I was thinking. Like, well, I like to the chair, you know, so I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I think when I look back on this project, my favorite thing about it was that it put me in conversation with a lot of people. Some people think of the, of the, like, the artist as someone alone in their studio, just like expressing their pain and their genius um, by themselves. And I think for me, that's really not, couldn't be further from my experience. Um, I really like work that puts me in conversation with other people. I really like being part of like a larger momentum. So I've always liked collaboration. Um, and so this was no exception. I really liked working it out with Jason. Like we, there are no stranger to like conflict in this process either. I think that that was really gratifying as well. Like being able to hash it out and have those conversations about like, no, like, I think it should be like this. Why? You know, like, that was really gratifying to me because in every moment that we had those, those encounters, like, 
I learned something or I learned more about what I wanted to express. Um, Jason and I are both Gemini's. I don't know if that matters, but it's a very, I'm very social. So it's very useful to me to be in conversation. I think best when talking. So um, this piece put me in conversation with not only Jason, but Better Days 2020 as an organization. Um, I got to work very closely with the contractors this summer. And so I learned, I was literally up there, like what you don't see in this picture is a porch right behind the piece. And I was just like up there reading because if you don't, if you're not there, you don't get to like catch these little minor moments where you're supposed to, where you should intervene. And so I was just like hanging out up there all summer with these contractors. Um, and like I did some of the work myself, but I also just like was in conversation with them all the time, being in conversation with the foundry, being in conversation um, with you guys right now. And also seeing how well the piece seems to work for tourists. Jason and I have both observed that every time we're up there, somebody's poking around. And it seems to be kind of what we had in mind where, where you kind of wander through the piece and put it together over time as you move through and take in the various details across the space. And I've had very successful, I mean, very um, gratifying conversations with young people who totally understand what we were after. And sometimes I think art can be a little bit alienating in that you have to have a special degree to understand what an artist means or even to understand what they're talking about when they speak. But this piece was like, totally not that was not an appropriate approach to a public work we needed we needed to speak a language that um that the majority of people who visit the site could understand even though it's a site of, of international tourism so um that's been really gratifying to see that people to actually get a lot out of what we what we did and you don't think people speak sculptural language because we're not really taught that in school because there's been so much funding cut from art programs in public schools. And that what goes first is 3D because it's expensive because it's like space, space consuming. And so it's very, it's very cool to see that although people don't have this, this training, there's this innate ability to understand the sculptural language we put in front of them. So that is my favorite part. I also really like these concrete cast, um, uh, molding from the the floorboards basically that we put on the wall. Those are really beautiful. The whole thing is just so stunning, and I really appreciate your your thoughts, both of you, about how how meaningful it was to you as an artist. And I I think that we as Utahns will find that this piece becomes more meaningful as time goes on and as more people get the chance to come and experience it and interact with it and learn and relearn like you were saying Jason re relearn things that they maybe had forgotten um, and just have the have the conversations uh, that need to happen to, to continue to to tend our democracy like you said Jason it's it's not something that's a one and done it's a, a work in progress always oh and that's one more thing I do want to say is that over the summer there were a lot of protests as everyone I'm sure is aware. And the gathering for, for many of the early protests was this lawn right next to the piece, the piece in progress. It was at some point a hole that they would gather near. And it was very cool because the National Guard had taken over the, the state capitol and blocked it off from protesters. So there was this line of National Guard in riot gear and protesters across the street next to our piece. And it just felt so appropriate to be making this monument to um, popular struggle, people fighting for what they believe in, um, right next to people doing that very thing, you know? And like, the suffrage was not a popular concept in its time. People did not support it for a long time. It was a very radical and upsetting prospect in its time. So this, this idea that like these the little guy was fighting these these um cops in riot gear felt very appropriate to, to what we were talking about and it was really cool to be working all day on this site or lounging reading a book while contractors worked on this site um and then just joining the protest right next door um protesters were extremely respectful of the work site nobody uh, engaged in any any sort of destruction of it um and 
what was one last thing I wanted to say about that? Oh yeah, I think one interesting conversation that, that art students might wanna have about this is the role of outsourcing and fabrication in, a, in an artist's practice. Like I think when I was a younger sculptor, I discovered that sometimes artists hired fabricators and I was horrified. It's like, well, you didn't make this, you know? You didn't make this with your hands and your blood and your tears. Um, and that's an interesting conversation to have. Like, where is the role of the artist if they didn't make this by their own hand? You can hear how, how involved Jason and I were in this entire process. It wouldn't exist without our authorship. But there's a lot of other people and their authorship involved. Why aren't their names on the plaque? I don't know. That's an interesting conversation to have with your class. That's an interesting conversation for, for any issue. I think, again, that's as for the, the suffrage movement itself, we know the leaders, right? But there's all these grassroots efforts of, of thousands of people, women and men, that, that don't get to be on the statue, but are just as important, right? Yeah. Well, as we wrap it up, we just thank you so much for being with us today. And we'll, I, I'm gonna let you guys have the last word. Is there anything that you guys wanna share with uh, Utah artists? you know, budding artists. We've got young people here with us today joining us. Uh, is there any advice or any words of wisdom you'd like to share with them before we sign off? I have some words of wisdom. Um, tell your parents to vote and um, every, to all your neighbors. Go knock on their doors and tell them to go vote. That is a very cute um, voting uh, participation campaign. Children coming to your door. Effective. Um, no, I don't, vote. Vote. <laughs> vote or treat. Um, yeah, I think budding artists, um, my advice would just be to look at a lot of art and follow your curiosities and trust your um, intuition. If there's something that you're interested in, follow it up. That's basically the entire practice of being an artist. Like, hey, I'm curious about this. I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about it, right? Nobody asked me to. Nobody cares if I do or don't, but I will be... I will be enriched by knowing or learning or doing X, Y, or Z impulse. That's it. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. And thanks for all who are joining us. Have a good day. Thank you.